afternoon, folks. And again, I would just endorse the comments of my colleagues. And thank you very much for inviting me along here today to talk about my study. I've just completed my study after six years uh, in the area. And one of the primary objectives, I think, which really wasn't at the start, was to try and give voice to the home help, the home care worker. And indeed, the genesis of this work commenced uh, with the findings from the earlier work of uh, Dr. Ryan, uh, who looked at uh, the complex needs of people living in the community. And one of the important things identified within that was the important role that domiciliary care workers and home helps played in terms of the provision of care and the importance of that within keeping the person in their own home. So that was certainly something that we, we started uh, looking at. And I'm, I'm very mindful that when I started the study, a very learned colleague of mine at the University of Ulster said to me, well, sure, look, Kevin, home helps and domiciliary care workers, sure, you know, my mummy has one. We all know what they do. What's the purpose of this? And, you know, I may have held that stereotypical view at the start, but I can certainly tell you that after six years of working with these people and listening to what they had to say uh, as a researcher and indeed as, as a nurse, uh, I certainly had no concept. That certainly came very much into to our own family. This is my father uh, at a very early stage of uh, his own end of life. And um, uh, home health services uh, were first espoused uh, within the actual foundations of the National Health Service way back in 1946 and the concept was that it would offer a cradle to grave a delivery of service and I suppose it wasn't until my father actually needed some degree of home care that I actually began to appreciate what home care workers actually did and my father and then you'll have heard all of the figures before from my colleagues about people wanting to be at home needing to be at home uh, wanting to be with their family and in effect aging in place and that was fundamental, certainly, for me as I started in this journey. There is, unfortunately, a background of uh, a dearth in the background of material in the role of domiciliary and home care workers, uh, simply because sometimes people do hold a stereotypical view. Indeed, that view is a view that spans right across Europe and indeed internationally and right into America in terms of the perception of this role, uh, a female working with poor wages, with poor levels of training, and indeed sometimes poor levels of support. And, and we wanted to address that dearth of literature. Uh, we've heard quite a bit uh, this afternoon already about government legislation, and my colleagues, both of my colleagues have gone before me, have talked about the importance of transforming your care. And indeed, page seven of the document clearly identifies that home will be the hub and the importance of that there as a strategic driver. And there are many other aspects in terms of a, a growing older population. And, and Asumta has clearly identified the population, the challenges, the complex living needs of people living at home. And indeed, here in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the, the differentiation between urban and rural provision of care, which is very paramount within our healthcare system. So there is an influence. Uh, in terms of the local, national and worldwide demographic trends uh, in terms of our population and people growing older, wanting to stay at home and remain at home. So we, we set out with a study uh, with two phases using a qualitative and a quantitative approach and we looked at grounded theory and I'm not here to, to, to pontificate about grounded theory but why grounded theory? It was quite simply because it, it's a theory that lends itself well to exploring an area when we really don't know anything about it. And, um, and that was what we set out to do. And we did this in various different ways, uh, qualitative methods using focus groups, semi-structured interviews. And I have a community forum meeting, but I'm adding to the theory of grounded theory as espoused by Strauss and Corbin, because such was the, the quality of what these people were about, that when I went into a rural part of Northern Ireland, and had told these people that I was coming from the University of Ulster to do research, the room, there was about 48 or 50 people, women, who gave up of their time to come and speak to me about their role. Our second phase uh, was informed by phase one, where we developed our questionnaire uh, with significant validity from what we were finding in phase one, and we went out then to a wider group to test the primary emergence of our theory. So, uh, in terms of the research, why grounded theory, but add hopefully 
to the quality of what we're about in terms of exploring this whole area and to hopefully offer us insight into the actual lived experiences of home helps. Indeed, Stacy in 2005, in a significant longitudinal study in America, identified that really there was significant dignity in what they referred to as dirty work. But really, what we didn't know, and we still really don't know too much about is what is the lived experience of the home care worker on a day-to-day -day basis? So these are the elements of grounded theory, constant comparative analysis. We compare information that came in from one piece of data with another piece of data, and we go out and we follow that data and we continuously ask questions. And an example of that might have been when I went out into a rural area here in Northern Ireland, and I can still see the faces of these women, and we were talking about why they did what they did. And one said to the other, but sir, look, son, why would I not do that? These people are my neighbours. And if I didn't do it, they'd be talking about me in the local post office. Do you not understand? And she looked at me as if I had two sort of heads on me and didn't really understand what it was about. So as researchers, we ask ourselves, what does this mean? And is this something that's here? Is it something that's occurring somewhere else? So we try to compare that and we come then sensitised to the data and very sensitive to that and move along. And then we might ask those questions again. So we had 179 participants in phase one, all grades of staff, including the managers. We didn't bring these people per se together because we didn't want to stifle the information that we were getting. So we, we, we looked at home health, we looked at domiciliary care workers, we looked at community care assistants, we looked at their managers, et cetera, et cetera. And we gathered all of that information over a long period of time. And remember at this time, uh, transforming your care in Northern Ireland and the implications of transforming your care for health and social care provision was occurring. So it was important then, and we continue to extend the parameters of our study to ensure that we captured all of the people who were involved in such care provision. In phase two, final post questionnaire to all home care staff that were employed within the Health and Social Care Trust. And at the time when we started, there were over a thousand, but due obviously to the rationalization, there were 734 at the point we reached at phase two. And we got a 42.8% response rate overall, which is quite favorable in comparison to other studies within home care, particularly from a UK perspective. Indeed, some of their findings are based on, on, on uh, you know, a participation rates of 10% and sometimes less. And indeed, in here in Northern Ireland, some of the previous studies had actually very small uh, response rates and focus primarily on how people perceived their work and why they stayed at their work and not really asking home health and domiciliary care workers why they did what they did and what was the meaning that they placed to their day. From the study we developed a theory, a grounded theory, a theory that in effect is well grounded within the data and uh, there are various different ways that we as researchers can try and ensure that that's well tested and, uh, and from a Strauss and Corbin and Corbin and Strauss perspective, we, we would develop that within a matrix to try and test it at various levels. And, and my colleague said to me today, she says, Kevin, don't be mentioning the jigsaw, but a jigsaw helps you to understand it because when you go into uh, a shop to buy a jigsaw and you can see the end piece in the front, but you have to assemble that there uh, to make it a whole. And uh, in terms of the matrix of grounded theory, you, you're working towards a finished piece with all of these parts. What we found was that there was a dissonance between the perceived centrality of the role, which I'm going to come to, and indeed the recognition of that role within the wider health and social care contexts. And a significant dissonance and disconnect existed. Our key findings were within six core areas that we looked at that helped to support our matrix and indeed the grounded theory. The location of care, the characteristics of carers, caring itself within the caregiving relationship, and role, role identification, role challenges, and role conflict. And because there was significant emphasis placed on the spoken voice of these people and bringing voice to them, then I thought perhaps as a researcher, that one of the best things for me to do today was to actually, rather than me talk, to, to actually let you see what they had to say to me. And at some level, we tried to apply meaning to their voices. So the location of care was differentiated between urban and rural 
locations. And within these locations, there definitely was a, a different shift in the ethos and the primacy of care in terms of what some of these home care workers would do in rural aspects of Northern Ireland to ensure a continuity of care. And the dynamic within that relationship, that caregiving relationship, was essential to how they perceived themselves as workers within health and social care. And indeed, if you look at some of these things, and I can still, the, the significance of this comment here, which is says, come on, Bridie, it's all very well talking about this to your man here, but if we don't get on with it, they will be talking about you and me in the post office. And the, the, the significance of what they were about and the reciprocity of what they received as carers were fundamental to the location of care. And there was a differentiation between the urban and rural aspects. There wasn't the same uh, sense of, of, of uh, a commitment and compassion within the rural areas that perhaps existed within some of the, uh, or in the urban areas that exist within some of the uh, rural areas. The home care workers were very able to identify the importance of their role. And they identified with their role fundamentally in terms of what they were doing and in terms of the complex care and caregiving and the activities of daily living. And they were very aware of some of the strategic drivers as a group of healthcare workers and how that impacted on their role and in terms of how their role had changed down through the years. And, uh, you know, within the role identification, there was the sustaining of professional relationships and the importance that they attached to the relationships. And indeed, many of the home care workers had taken on this formal caregiving role, even in the absence of uh, training and formal caring experience. Challenges existed with respect to role, but they just weren't challenges with respect to how they performed their role. These were challenges within the wider context of health and social care. Their understanding that there were financial constraints with respect to care provision, but they demonstrated a significant insight into the challenges of care provision, particularly with respect to time and the importance of their role, liaison and working with the family. Indeed, many of these home care workers overcame these personal challenges by actually returning to the homes of the people that they were caring for in their own times. And the role itself was categorised into both positive and negative aspects, and their caring role was central to them as people and to providing what they believed were, in effect, day-to-day uh, -day life with importance and, indeed, fulfilling a valuable role within health and social care. Conflict, of course, existed, and this just wasn't conflict with in themselves as individuals. This was conflict within some of the teams. The teams were going through transitions in terms of home health and domiciliary care workers. But there was certainly a continuity within all aspects of the home care workers. So they were more together than they were separate. And the conflict certainly existed with other members, professional members of health and social care. There was certainly a significant conflict with respect to social workers and the fact that social workers disregarded these people um, in terms of the importance of assessments, a, a care reviews and things like that. And they, they felt that this caused them conflict because they spent a significant amount of time with the carer and the individual and their views weren't respected within the context of health and social care. Um, they, uh, home helps themselves and the home care workers then began to develop either adaptive, either positive or maladaptive coping strategies to enable them to cope. One might argue that a home help going back into a home after hours isn't something that perhaps we should condone. And indeed, when I followed through in that thought with a, a, a woman who was 64 years of age herself, who didn't drive and rode her bicycle, and again, she looked at me with the same degree of incredulity as to, well, why would I not go back? If I don't go back, then this person will suffer social isolation. They're part of my extended family. Of course I'm going to go back. Which then brought us on to looking at what were these characteristics of carers and the importance of this and how they worked with the person in getting to know them, giving their work 100%, the reciprocity within the relationship, 
Carers talked about the expression of love for the client related to the individual's own personal caring disposition and their life experiences. The care and compassion of their role within the caregiving relationship enabled them to treat the client as a whole person. This word, this phrase, a whole person, an individual in their own right, trying to ensure that what they were doing in terms of their caring would enable that person to remain at home for as long as they would like. And indeed the contention was, why would you not want to do that? Everybody likes their own wee corner at the end of the day. If there's enough positive care provided by us in the community, well, then it'll stop them from being shipped into a nursing home. And you'll see that my colleague has already talked about those transitions within families and the complexity that that can cause within a caring unit. In terms, therefore, of policy and policy implications, there are implications that the research puts forward for the issue of health and social care and its provision at an organisational level. The caring trajectory for the client within this concept of caring. The continuity of the caring ethos for home care within a person-centred practice framework. In terms of health and social care, we have heard the significant evidence about the uh, ageing population. Stockdale in 2009 will argue that whilst we understand issues regarding ageing and an older population, they are sometimes more focused on uh, issues of pension and care rather than the understanding of the, the levels of informal caring and the continuity of caring. In terms of this, there's obviously a need to look at how we provide care, the model that underpins the effectiveness of care, and sometimes the model uh, that we, we are very reliant on and its modus operandi is not perhaps one that best serves a focus, for example, on reablement. The significance of the work that these people undertake, the value that they attach to their role, their need to be connected to caring is central to our concept of caring and indeed to the realisation that if we do want to keep the home as the hub, that these workers play an essential role an interconnected role and the centrality of that unfortunately is not necessarily recognised within some of our current policy and strategy drivers. The location of care and Asumta has identified this in terms of the whole issue of social capital and what living in a rural community or what living in a community can do and some of the things that these workers would do to effect caring even in the midst of for example, some of the very bad and clement weather that we experienced whilst I was collecting the data, you know, getting farmers to drive tractors so that you could get to a person clearly motivated by altruistic caring, selfless caring to get to their clients. Sometimes the, the same wasn't as evident within the town areas where some of the workers would say, well, look, it's not my responsibility if I can't get out. Whereas in the rural areas, they saw it as a, central thing to do. Training was central and is one of the core reasons why perhaps there is this stereotypical view of the home care worker, this underpaid, perhaps undereducated, poorly trained female. And there is no clear recognition and indeed Rolf would argue that whilst professional groups work well together, there is unfortunately that degree of dissonance between them. And this group clearly had a dissonance with other health and social care workers in terms of the recognition of what they do. How therefore do we ensure that we can respond to the process of change with a model for effective practice? I think to do this, we need to continue to monitor and review the impact of home care on older adults' meanings of home and its potential impact on their recovery. We hear a lot about home as the hub the centrality of the home, but a definition of what actually constitutes home is, is not necessarily as evident within the literature. And you, you'll see there what Asumta was talking about, what sometimes when people move in to the nursing home, then their longevity of life is actually increased because that then becomes their new home. And sometimes it's not clearly recognised. Supervision within the, the HPSS requirements is a core issue and the need for these people 
these home care workers to have effective supervisory and clinical supervisory positions uh, are central to the support of the home care worker. It is incredible to say that complex client assessments do take place in our homes for older people and that the home care worker is not involved either informally or formally in this process and the need for our health and social care colleagues to embrace the Northern Ireland single assessment tool in a meaningful intercollegiate collaborative way with all grades of worker will be central to the need to shift the policy ideology of caring in home. Training will be central to that, the need for these workers to have a nationally recognised qualification framework that other healthcare professionals like nurses, like social workers, like social work assistants and people will recognise and that they are accepted as having a valuable contribution to play. The current training and support mechanisms must be inclusive of client assessment and client evaluation. I mean, in our home, the person that we chased, believe it or not, in caring for my father, was the social worker, but she spent more time telling us what we shouldn't be doing, whereas the wee home help kept telling my sister what she could do to help her day better. And that was based on her experience. And how someone then could conduct this assessment without at times even coming into the family home to speak to the person that they were assessing was incredible. So home care staff must participate in a collegiate manner with these assessments and indeed their care reviews. My colleagues, both of them, have already articulated that the home is clearly the hub. An operational definition of this, however, is clearly needed that takes due cognizance of an urban and rural split for such care provision. Quality assurance mechanisms must extrapolate further on the role of home care workers and their experience and how they negotiate their work on a daily basis, thus enabling a more effective responding to needs and indeed our capacity to comply with legislative and regulatory frameworks in the provision of such health and social care. Our integrated service delivery model as espoused within transforming your care must be implemented as a priority for effective service provision. Finally, Jones et al. have done quite a number of longitudinal studies from the UK framework with respect to reablement. And I think that in terms of all of those people that I met, one individual would have defined herself as a reablement officer or a reablement support worker. So of the 734 that I met, one of them had a focus of reablement. And clearly the model that was underpinning the service really wasn't perhaps fit for purpose. Thank you very much.